All right, so to get right in to um, the, the <laughs> into the class here. So the first thing you'll want to do when you're oh actually first so Premiere um, just for people uh, less familiar is a, uh, a nonlinear editing system uh, track based. And uh, it's, it's a very, very popular one, especially among um, amateur and professional filmmakers. Um, it is used in both low budget and big budget productions. Uh, the Deadpool movie from 2016, I, I just learned that this morning was actually edited with Premiere. Um, and uh, it's available on all of our iMacs here at Metro East, all of our laptops carry it. Um, and especially if you don't have a Mac, you can't use Final Cut, which is what we normally teach. This is a, this is a great thing to have on your PC at home. Um, and yeah, this is just an opportunity to see what a different editing software looks like if you're more familiar with Final Cut or with uh, any, any other uh, sort of editing system. So to get right onto it now, um, before you ever really want to start up Adobe Premiere, you're going to want to actually get your footage in order. So what we have here is a very basic sort of organization system. So the, the thing that makes this different, especially from something like Final Cut, is that with Final Cut, when you import footage into it, it's all in one big file. So you'll have a, a Final Cut a library, that they call it, and that just contains all your footage, it contains all your render files, it contains the entire thing. And that's very consolidated, but it can also make you uh, um, a little laissez-faire about how you organize things. But with Premiere, it is very important that you keep things um, in the right spots um, because if you were to take your project file and move it somewhere else, if you were to say just move it to the desktop or you were to take a video in here and move it to the desktop, you will get a message that looks a lot like that where it's saying, hey, I don't know, where, where'd you just put the video? Uh, where'd you just put all this audio and stuff? And that's because the way Premiere works is that it, instead of taking everything into itself, it links to all the footage. So it's, it's, it's vital that it knows at all times where everything is. So the easiest way to do that is just to do a simple structure where you organize things by, by your show, then probably by episode, and then something that looks like this. And it doesn't have to look exactly like this, but this is a um, very handy basic one that to use. So I've separated the original video into A and B roll, and I'll explain the difference between those two in a minute. Uh, sound effects, music, graphics, which is currently empty, and then exports and the actual project files. And the advantage of organizing it like this is that I could take the whole folder move it somewhere else, and then when I start that Premiere project again, I, it won't end up broken like this. So, so um, and, and the really the benefit of having it like this, because uh, some of you might be wondering, well, why do it that way, is that this keeps the Premiere um, file very small. You can see there, it's 91 kilobytes, easily sent in an email, easily sent in a messenger. If you are working with someone and assuming they have the same files that you do, they, you can send your progress to them and just easily be able to keep them updated on what, on what you're currently doing. So now that that's all out of the way, we can actually start Premiere. So, um, let's see, and that'll take it a second. Uh, so yeah, and, and just uh, just to be clear, the when it when an, a message like this comes up, it's not the end of the world. You can 
relocate footage, you can put the um, file back where you had it and it'll, and it'll just auto locate. And in fact, it's ability to auto locate footage is very good. It's a lot better than it used to be. But nonetheless, you'll want to avoid doing that if you can. And especially if you if you're working on a big project or a lot of projects, you'll 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 find that eventually, it's just a lot simpler to keep things keep things organized. Yep, so let's see here. I've seen a question, is the that organization method industry standard? I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's industry standard. It's the way that I've um, been taught um, in college. Uh, the main thing, though, is just you want it to be standard across um, what you do. You w the main thing is just consistency. So if um, it, if, if you have it like different, if you just have the A roll and B roll combined into an original um, original video or something like that, if you have music and sound effects combined, that's fine. Just just make sure that it's consistent across all the different things you're doing, because that just makes it easier for anyone who's parsing through your your folders to be able to get it. The numbers aren't necessarily specific to the organizational for for the data it's just the labeling of the data however whichever particular order you don't have to give the sign them a numerical value no no i i the reason i do that is just so that it it always stays in the order that i want it to that that's the main thing because otherwise it'll be inclined to sort them alphabetically or by the the most recent file and that's not necessarily what i want If anyone cares, the way the production team does it, we also number them, but we do, we combine sound effects and music into one, and then A roll and B roll is also one, and that we label just footage. So it, it works both ways. Um, I was just curious about, you know, if you somehow got hired to do a freelance Netflix gig, how like those guys do it. They might just tell you straight up, like, they, they may have some sort of um, or like organizational chart where they're like, we need you to follow these standards. Um, but if not, it's as, I said, as long as it's easy to follow. Um, and I say most, most folks in the industry would be able to figure out what this means um, and it, it works. So uh, now this is finally started up. Um, going to get into starting a new project. So when you first open it up, you'll see all of the most recent things you've worked on and how long ago that was. To start a new one, go up to new project right here. Give it a name. You tell it where you want it to go, which uh, in this case, it's going to the right place. It's going under project files, which is where I want to go. And then for the rest of it, most of the time you can just um, you can just leave it as is. Sometimes you may want to adjust where the scratch disks are going. If you're capturing video, for instance, you may want to go to its own file. Uh, you may want your auto saves to go into a separate place where they're a, a little more secure. But if if you're just starting a basic project, you can normally just leave things as is. So uh, this is the most basic screen, um, most basic uh, way that Premiere is laid out. But as you can see here at the top, there are multiple options to change how you want um, Premiere to look. So 
Um, this is, this, they, they call this one the editing view because that, that's what Premiere thinks is the most um, optimal for editing. You've got your timeline here, your media browser here, effects panel, program panel, but you can also do an assembly one that expands the media browser so you can see the, the clips that you're bringing in. You've got an effects panel, which uh, is going to expand the effects side so you can see that a little easier. And I swear this is the, uh, <laughs> this is the part where it's going to uh, wheel a lot just because it has to think about a few things. But after this, it's not gonna do that very often. Okay, but the other thing to keep in mind when you are um, trying to work in a specific place is something called the tilde key. The tilde key is located right there on your keyboard, just underneath escape, just above the tab. And what you can do with that is that when you are in any panel in here, just click on it, hit the tilde key, and it expands it to the entire screen. And that works for any screen in here. And that is going to save you a lot of hassle if you're trying to organize things in here and it's a pretty small screen to work with. Set the tilde key, there you go. Um, now, I'm gonna go into importing. So there is a few ways to import uh, media into this um, into this browser here. So first way we can do is go up to file, go import, then go to where the fol folders are, and then just select all of them. You can do that by either clicking the first one, holding shift, clicking the last one, that selects all of those. Or you can also hold down the command key, click multiple times. If you're on Windows, you'd hold down the control key instead. And then once you have all of them, just click import, and that brings them all in. The other ways are just going to uh, the folder itself, doing the same thing, but this time just dragging them over. That also works. And uh, the third way is to use this little guy here called the media browser. And this gives you a lot more options. So you'll see here it has your folder directory. And if you navigate it over to where the folder you're trying to work on is, you can see all the different fo folders you have. And you can actually, before you import, preview the videos you have. And it's the same shot and you cut a set set. So if you hit the space bar while you're on it, it'll play. These are photos, uh, or you can also get a- And you can hear the audio. You can also <laughs> scan over it by <laughs> clicking and dragging this little bar here. Let's give you an idea of what exactly is in here before you import it. Uh, if you're looking for something specific and you don't necessarily want to import all, every um, file in there, that's a very useful thing to know. So with that, and uh, when you're in the media browser, when you want to import, you just right click. Oh, let's right click. Hold on. There it is. Right click and click import. So, um, so now that we're in here, uh, this is this is where all your footage goes when you import it. Um, you so normally once I've imported footage, I will like to add another folder. Although in Premiere folders are called bins, so um, you do that by going down here to where it says new bin. It's a little hard to see the text; my cursor is blocking it, but it says new bin. Click it, and I'll just make one that's for sequences. Hoping I'm spelling that right. Um, And you can see that every single one of these folders contains stuff. The graphics one obviously doesn't because it was empty. Um, 
what part am I on now? Oh, I skipped over a question section. I'm sorry about that. Do we have any, any questions uh, for what's happened so far? What screen are you in? I'm in the uh, media browser screen. So um, as I said, it's the, the one that's normally on the lower left in an editing one. And to just expand it, you hit the tilde key. Um, again, uh, just to show you where that is on your keyboard, it's right about there. And that's Got it, cool. The Mac. So, all right, any other questions? No questions, but I just wanted to take a minute to remind everyone that uh, we are recording this session and that's just what's going on. So for those of you that weren't here in the beginning, just wanted to let you know that that is happening. All right, so moving on. Uh, there's many different ways to view um, everything that's in here. Uh, I currently have it in the list view, but you can also view things in uh, gallery view. I believe that's what it's called. Let's get my cursors blocking it. Which just gives you a view like this, which is how it looked in the media browser. Once again, same rules apply as far as what you can and cannot do. So just scanning through like that. Um, but, and in the latest version of Premiere, they also have this thing called freeform view, which if you're familiar with um, Macs, when you have them in a view like this, you can move them all over the place and they don't necessarily snap to a grid. And this is the same kind of thing in here. So if it helps you organize your media, you can put them anywhere you want on the screen. And if, if, if that helps you in your organization process, I encourage you to do it. If, if, and a handy little tip, if you accidentally get it to where all the clips are on top of each other and you're kind of messed up, you can easily just right click and go to align to grid and everything will be back in a, in a seeable place. So switching back to list view, uh, you get in list view, you can see all sorts of different information about the clips in here such as their frame rate, uh, where, how long it is, um, video ends and out points, which I'll explain in a second. Um, and you can also add things to it, such as uh, descriptions of what each one is and uh, what scene it is in your film, what shot um, take it is, uh, whether or not it's a shot that you like or not. All, all of that can be done here. And the cool thing about it is that all of it is searchable. So if I add a description to here, and then I try to just go back to the main one here, I'm just gonna search for a certain clip. Now, let's do it back in list view. Yeah, so just to do that again so it's more easy to see start searching and uh, what do you know shows up because that's in the description so for any kind of organization task it's a very handy thing to have on and in some very large productions you'll have people that take all of the footage and their whole job is just filling out all these sections to make it so that when the editor's using it it's it's very simple um, for them to find what they need to find so now that we've got all of that stuff out of the way, we can actually start some sort of editing process. So easiest way to actually start, uh, to actually start a sequence, which is what you do with the timeline, is just take a clip and move it into here. And the video, um, the timeline will automatically adjust its settings to the settings of the video that you have um, that you have placed in there. So for instance, if I, um, so for instance, right now, the clip I just dragged in is 29.97 frames per second. And so is the timeline that was just made. And if you remember, I made that timeline folder or sequence folder. Um, so I'm just going to place it in there. 
You can rename it to whatever you want, and I suggest you do. Um, if you, if there's nothing in a sequence and you try to add something that does not conform to what um, the timeline was working on, such as this thing that's uh, 60 frames per second, it'll give you a warning and, and tell you that it doesn't match the settings. Do you want to change the settings to match this? And you can click yes or no. Um, however, if there's a bit of media in here already and you add something that is not the same as that media, it'll just keep the settings automatically. It won't give that option to change it to fit the new thing that comes in there as long as there's footage in for it to, for it to use. Um, the other way to start the sequence though is just to go up to File, New, and Sequence. And you have a lot of different options you can work with here um, that just conforms to any kind of video you might want to make. But for the most part, that's not something you're gonna have to worry about because it is a lot easier just to take a video that you want the, the film to be based on and just change the settings to match that one. Now, definitely another thing that you're gonna wanna see um, that's different from uh, other editors like Final Cut is that in Final Cut, if I were to move another clip to the side here and let it go, it would immediately snap back to uh, um, the one at the start. And in Premiere, this is not the case. Uh, this is how the track-based editing works. And it gives you a certain level of freedom, but it also comes with the consequence that if you don't quite align things correctly, you can end up with a gap. Um, there are ways to um, get rid of gaps. Uh, the way I like to do is to click on space right here. You can right click and click ripple delete. And that snaps that back into place. You can also just click it and hit the delete button and it snaps that into place as well. But the, the most useful one and the one you're gonna be using uh, all the time, whether you think about it or not, is this guy right here. And that is the snap in timeline tool. It looks like a little magnet. And what that does is, let me just turn it off so you can see what it does, is that it automatically aligns things. So when, so right now, as you can see, I'm moving it pretty close. I can't quite tell. I'm hoping that's where they connect, but it's like you can't really tell that they're connected or not. But if I turn on snap, when I get close, it'll automatically kind of pull it in. And it snaps to both of her clips. It also snaps to the playhead here. So if you're trying to make some precision edits, um, you can put the playhead where you want the clip to go and it'll just kind of snap there when you get close. Um, the other things that you, the other little tools you have in hand are things like the trim tool here. As you can see, when I move close to the edge of a clip, my cursor changes to something like this. This is the trim. If you click and drag, you can use that to shorten a clip and it works from either end. You can see that they change depending on what end it is. You can also use it to extend a clip that you've already um, changed. And you'll notice that uh, you can extend it only to the point where the video um, goes. So I can't expand it farther than this video's original length was. Uh, if you're in, in an intersection between two clips, you can tell which clip it is grabbing onto by which direction it is facing. So right now, it's at the end of the first clip. And right now, it's at the beginning of the second clip. There. Um, and, oh, and when you're trimming, you can see at the bottom there, there is 
uh, some numbers that show up and those basically show how much you're cutting off of it and how much time is left because of what you've cut off. So right now it's saying that I have cut off 20 seconds and 20 seconds are remaining. As I move that back, the numbers change. Uh, and another very useful tool to, to use, um, especially if, you're, if you've just come off a final cut, is ripple edits. And those allow you to, what's that? Let me just zoom in a bit. Those allow you so that when you're trimming something, it'll actually snap that, um, that clip that's at the end to it automatically. So instead of having those gaps, let me just bring it, bring it back to where, to normal. Let's use a regular trim. So instead of leaving a gap like that, it'll bring it forward with it. And you'll definitely be using that a lot. Um, So that's it for the tools. And you'll just notice there, there was a little uh, icon that showed up and that was actually something I was just about to get into, uh, saving. It's, um, this, uh, this program does not um, save every time you make an edit. It's, so it is very important that you know how to save it yourself. So if you go up to file, you click save, and that saves your progress. The shortcut to it is Command S, and I recommend you you memorize that command. It's Command S, and the 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 general rule of of saving is you can't do it too often. Just just save all the time. It doesn't take very long, but if a disaster were to happen, if you're uh, if your computer had some sort of meltdown, you don't want to be caught having lost uh, um, the last 15 minutes of editing. Uh, it's just so just to avoid that, just be sure to do to command S. Um, Premiere does have auto save options. If you go to um, where it says Premiere up here, go to preferences, auto save. Uh, it, um, by default, it automatically saves projects every 15 minutes. You can obviously change that to every, every one minute, every five minutes. Um, and uh, and uh, you can also choose how many times that it can create a new backup, things like that. Um, but as I said, it doesn't save after every edit. It saves after a certain period of time. And 15 minutes might not seem like much time, but if you're really, really into a project, losing 15 minutes can be really, really frustrating. So just keep that in mind, Command S. And the other um, thing you'll definitely, uh, shortcut you'll definitely want to remember is uh, Command Z. So say I'm making a very complicated edit here, and then Oh no, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, how do I undo that? Go up to edit, undo. And the shortcut to that is command Z. So it's again, by, oh, oh no, I messed up. The command Z and it goes back. And it actually does keep a very long memory of, uh, of all the edits you've done. Um, so I just command Z at about 10, 10 or so times right there, and it, and it went back each time. So, um, so normally though, uh, when you are actually putting in clips here, you wouldn't want to be dragging and dropping as I am. Uh, the more proper way to do it is through the source monitor here. So when you double click on a clip, you'll you'll come up with a preview here of the entire clip. You can run through it, see exactly what you want. And you'll want to set in and out points of the section you want. So normally when you're filming something, you'll have a section that's like 10 seconds at the beginning where you're just like getting queuing up speed or something. And then maybe a little bit at the end where the director shouts cut 
Um, and in any kind of situation, there will always be those things. So you can just cut them out right here. So say I want, I go a little bit in here. I just set my endpoints by clicking this. You can also um, type um, I, I is the shortcut for that. Set the out point right here, clicking this. And now when I drop that clip in, it'll, you'll notice that it's already pre-trimmed. And in fact, I'll make that a little more obvious by setting the in and out points much closer together. It's already trimmed to that section. And you'll also notice that you can expand from that. It's not limiting you um, in terms of how far out you can go, but uh, it's, it's only showing you the section that you're looking for. That's the important part. Um, and you can clear this by right clicking and clicking clear in and out. Um, but when you are making a clip though, as I said though, I was talking about dragging and dropping. Let's set an in and an out point. Normally, you, instead of dragging and dropping, you'll want to use these two tools right here. This is insert and this is overwrite. So what insert does is that when I'm at the very, um, I'm at the part where I want to drop in my footage, uh, insert, insert will drop it in there and push everything else out of the way. Um, and that contrasts it from overwrite, where if I put it somewhere, say right here, it won't push everything out of the way, it will just replace it. And you can actually set which, um, which tracks that go onto by arming them right here. So say I want um, this clip right here to go up on the top, I just, arm um, the second audio track and the second video track. I click overwrite and now it's up here. It's in the second video track, second audio track and that works for any combination that you might want. So notice I know armed video one and audio three and it showed up like that. So, um, So uh, it seems like it's been a while since I've had any kind of question times and I'm noticing there's some chat going on. So let's, let's take in some questions if we have any. How do you turn that video, or I'm sorry, the audio off if you wanted it off? Um, so you, are you talking about like, like just removing the audio from the video or just muting it so that you can um, concentrate on something else for the moment? Uh, just getting rid of it. Say you had multiple lines and you wanted just to use one video or audio track, not all three audio tracks. Um, yeah, so there is a section in here later where I can go into that in more detail, but the, the simple answer is, say I have right here, there's two audio tracks and they're conflicting with each other. Um, there's two ways. One is just to lay one of the audio on top of the other, and that replaces it. Okay. So now you'll just have the one audio track. And the other way would be to unlink the two. So there's a video and the audio track. If you right click on it, you click unlink, it separates them. So they're no longer the same entity. And you could just delete the track and that would be, that, that would be it. Um, as I said, I'm going to go into that a little later, but that, that, that's, the, that's the answer, basically. Cool, thanks. All right, any other questions? Let's see, I'm reading the tutorial right now. And there was one about um, whether we're sharing the link, the video link, when we're uh, done. I believe so. Yeah, if it's if it's getting uploaded to to, if you're talking about the recording, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. If it's getting uploaded to YouTube, then yeah, we'll we'll definitely have a link for you.
I'm seeing a question about um, uh, will, how, how will you address how to, um, so how to troubleshoot video footage having different settings. Um, so so I, I assume you're talking about um, when a timeline is set up for a specific kind of video and the and you bring in one that is not in the same settings and it's conflicting in some way with it. Um, well, the the main thing there is just uh, if possible, you'll just want them to to be aligned. Like if like normally this can actually take in quite a lot of uh, differentiation and things. So even though this is 60 frames per second, it still plays. It's not like breaking the system or anything. It's not quite matched up to the aspect ratio here, but that can be easily fixed by um, using the effect settings. Uh, so if I, uh, so just, I'll get into this panel a lot later as well, so don't, don't worry about that, but you just scale it up a bit and it, it's pretty much fine. Um, but if it's like severe enough to where it's just not working for you, like it's just con conflicting, my, I would suggest just using a program, perhaps like Media Encoder or something like that that can convert video and just convert it to the same, um, the same dimensions that you're working with. Uh, as I said, it's not normally necessary, but if that's the if that's how it is, that's how it is. So um, hopefully that answered the question there. Um, so now moving on. Let's see what do we got next? Okay, so now we're just going to go to some basic editing tricks here. Let me. Let me reset this timeline here because it's a bit messy. Uh, there. Let me rearm things back to back to neutral there. So when you are editing, um, it's important to note. Um, Ju just like how you are cutting things. So, um, so let's see. That's full. Hold on. Let's clear the in and out points of this. So it's important to realize yeah, the, um, that there's many different ways to transition between clips. So obviously, if you're editing something that has multiple clips, you're going to have to transition between them in some form or another. And the most common way to do that is through a cut. So um, that's done using the blade tool up here, or razor tool, I'm sorry. Um, that's accessed by pressing C or by clicking this uh, this razor right here. And so with it cut, you can trim off that section of the clip. Once again, deleting that here. Or if you're wanting to be a little more professional about it, you can use the ripple edit tool to grab the end yourself and do it like that. So say that section I just cut out of the middle here, I don't want that in there. So this is an interview with uh, one of our producers, Emily. She's talking about um, she's talking about different editing techniques. I know it's a little meta, but that's that, that's the footage we have. Um, so say there's a section in there that I just I'm not, I'm just not feeling for whatever reason. I, it's distracting from the original point, or it's not what uh, we're trying to convey. So I I just cut it out. Um, but look what happens when you play it just as it is. Notice, and I'll just mute it so it's easier to concentrate on. And you mute tracks by clicking that, by the way, uh, the M for mute. Um, you'll notice that she kind of jumps. That is known as a jump cut. 
And that is not considered very good because it's, um, it's, it's uh, sporadic and uh, kind of, it's a very noticeable edit that takes people out of what they're seeing. So it's, it's considered very bad practice to just cut from the same angle of that same person into a later stage of that same person. And there are ways to, um, to alter that. You can perhaps use a different transition. Um, so say you go, you decide, I want to just do a cross dissolve um, transition. Upper transitions are found here in the effects bay. Video transitions, solve. I'm gonna, gonna drop in a cross dissolve here. And I'll, I'll go into transitions a little more later. But say, yeah, you know, let's put in a little dissolve. It still doesn't look very good. <laughs> I mean, it's probably better than nothing, especially if I lengthened it a bit. Oh, oh let's see. It. Let me zoom in a bit. You can zoom in by either grabbing here and it'll zoom in and out based on where the playhead is. You can also do it by hitting the, um, the plus and minus buttons on your keyboard. But let's say I, I just extend this a little more. Yeah, it, looks, it looks sort of like she's merging with her own ghost. So um, still not, not the best way to handle something like that. So instead, there are other ways. And uh, one of the simpler ways is just when you're doing, especially an interview style thing like this, is you just have them, you just, if you don't have two cameras to shoot two different angles, you ask um, the, your talent the same questions twice, but from the two different angles. So here we have a medium shot um, right here, and we have a close up. And she's been asked the same questions in both of them. So, so say in, and you know, you can ask them to give like the same answer both times. Um, and that'll help you kind of match things up. So let's trim this. So let's say she's talking about, well, there's this thing you're trying to avoid and it's called jump cuts. And the reason why jump cuts are bad is jump cuts are bad is because of X. Um, well, in the second clip here, she could also say, "Well, I don't like jump cuts, and the reason jump cuts are bad is because of X." So you could take, so you could say, "Well, I didn't quite like how she framed it in the first part of this second one." But let's take the first part of that first one. She says, "Jump cuts are are very bad for things." Because, and then cut to because of X. And it did just freeze on me a second there, but you'll notice that, that is a lot smoother and it doesn't quite take you out of it. So that it'll be a little better if her mouth was in the same position in both cases. I'm not really listening to the audio here, so I'm not doing that um, in the most proper way, but it, that is a very simple way um, and that's done long before editing to, to fix something like that. And the other way would be to use um, that thing I mentioned earlier, but I didn't quite get into. So I mentioned at the very beginning that I've separated A roll and B roll. So A roll is basically your main, um, the main part of your video. So if you're doing an interview like this, the interview is your A roll. That's what your video is built upon. And this works for all sorts of other things. If you're, if you're doing a video on like skateboarding stunts, the, the skateboarding stunts are your A roll. Um, and uh, Unless, of course, you're doing interviews in that one, too, in which case the interviews are your A roll. But I'm just talking like the video itself is stunts. Um, B roll is things that are not 
the main part of the video, but there are things related to it that sort of enhance it. So in this case, we have a video here of Emily working at an iMac. We have video of her hand um, using a mouse. And we have a screen capture of the actual um, edit system she's using. So what I can do here is very simply, it's just shorten up this little section here with the uh, with her working at the computer and just drop that in like so. So then she can say, well, there's this thing you're trying to avoid and it's called jump cuts. And uh, the reason jump cuts are bad is because of X, Y, Z. And you definitely want to avoid something like that. And that's completely totally covers it up um, because uh, any tracks that are above the um, any tracks that are above on the layer on the video layer will cover things that are below the video layer um, and that's in opposition to the audio layer in which case if there's multiple tracks they stack mm -hmm. on top of each other and we'll we and in fact for this where the audio that's coming through the B-roll is not useful. You'd want to do that technique I mentioned earlier, where you unlink it and just delete it. Um, da -da -da -da. Oh yeah, so um, just a couple other shortcuts. So each one of these tools here has a shortcut on the keyboard for them. The selection tool, which is the main tool I'm using here, is V. Blade, as I mentioned, is C, or Razor, uh, is C. Uh, ripple is B. Um, select forward is A. Slip is Y. A slip. Uh, basically, let's see. I haven't used slip in a while, I'm sorry. Probably shouldn't have just clicked on that. <laughs> And, uh, but a, a slip is another, is a thing like related to Ripple. You can use it to um, switch where clips are. Um, there's a text tool, which I'll go into. That's just basic graphics and hand. Uh, hand basically is just used for moving the timeline around. It's, it doesn't, you can't select anything with it. Um, and yeah, each one of those has a shortcut. And another useful shortcut to know is the up and down keys and the left and right keys. So up and down take you to the beginnings and ends of the most recent clips of the clip that you're on, basically. Um, so if you want to quickly get to one end or the other, you use that. And left and right moves you along one frame at a time. So I'm just tapping it right now. And you move on one frame every time you tap it. And that's very useful for very precision editing. OK, uh, I know just went over a lot. And I'm, I'm, hope, and I hope and I'm getting it over. Is there any questions for this section? Uh, somebody asked what the um, the key short for sh shortcut for cross dissolve is. It's technically a trick question. Um, the shortcut key for your default transition, let me just get rid of that so I can get to there, is Command D. So I'm pretty sure it was. You have to add the playhead ex exactly. And the other trick being that if there's not enough there footage to cross dissolve, it won't cross dissolve. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's one thing. And the problem that was happening there is that both sides weren't selected. But Command D puts in your default transition. And the reason I don't say it's the cross dissolve button is because when you're in transitions, 
uh, you, like, by default, cross dissolve is your default. Um, so when you first start up um, Premiere, that's what it shows up as. But you could set literally anything to be your default. And you can tell it's default because it's highlighted in, in blue. So if I want uh, Iris Cross to be my default transition, I'll just Command D right now. And now, instead of a, a cross dissolve, it's an iris transition. So, so, technically a trick question, but yeah, that's Command D. And as Gene said, there are a couple of uh, caveats as to where it will work and where it will not. Uh, was, there you go. Okay. So now we're going to get a bit more into sound. So, uh, the main thing you want to be aware of is the VU meters on the side here. Actually, it's almost 11 o'clock. Um, how's everyone feeling right now? Just realized the time that was flying by. We need to take a break, or are we feeling like everybody's doing good and we can just keep pushing on, or how are you guys doing? No, everybody's good. All right. Okay. All righty. So, okie dokie. Just let me know. I'll ask again next question time if you guys want to take one. But um, the the f main thing to look into with edit, with uh, audio is this thing here on the side here called the VU meter. Um, and that is basically in objective measure of how um, how loud your clip is. Because, and the reason why that's very important is because, um, say I'm listening to a clip here, and it sounds like it's a certain level. But if I take my volume, like on the Mac itself, and I turn it down, well, now it sounds too quiet, doesn't it? Um, and if I turn it up a lot higher, oh, now it's too loud. And, and, and the problem with like um, relying on sound like that is that you can accidentally make a video that's much too quiet or much too loud. And the way to avoid that is just to look at the VU meter here and see where the ranges are. So for most things, you'll want it to be around peaking and peaking is its uh, highest point at around negative 12. Uh, the human voice uh, goes between negative six and negative 12. And it's okay to have the human voice around that level. Um, but for most things, for your background noise, you'll want it around about negative 12. Um, and, uh, it, but you know, it's not a hard and fast rule. Just because something goes up to negative nine doesn't mean, oh my God, I need to fix this. It's just keep it around that level and it'll be fine. Um, to do more um, editing though, specifically of, of audio here, you'll want to expand an aud the audio track so you can see it better. You can do that. But if you go to the line in between two audio tracks here, you'll notice the cursor changed. Oh, just click and drag it down. That gives you a lot more information. And I'll zoom in once again um, by, by doing this. And you'll notice that there is a visual representation of the clip here. And uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is that uh, the more astute among you, I have noticed that there are two different levels going on. So the one on the right here is peaking at around negative 12. The one on the left is at about negative 36. So, um, so what happened here is that when they were recording the video, they ha you have a left and a right channel. And they set the right channel to be her mic right here that's pinned to her shirt. And they set the left channel to be the camera audio. And the reason they did that is because in case something went horribly wrong with this mic, they would still have audio to use. And it's a, it's a very good technique to use when filming. But obviously, 
anyone wearing headphones right here would be saying, well, my right ear is getting a lot of love here. But the left ear so sounds pretty bad. And you don't want to release the video like that. So uh, to fix a specific kind of situation like that, you can right click on any clip here and go to audio channels. And when you do that, you can select which, um, which channel is coming through. So if on this clip, if for some reason I just wanted the camera audio coming through, um, like if I just wanted to hear what that sounds like, I can tell, say, okay, I want coming through the, um, I want the media source channels left coming through the, um, the timelines right. And hopefully that's not too confusing. It's a little, it's a little bit of a trip up, but basically um, this up here is what the clip was actually made with. And this right here is what's actually being listened to. Um, and you can actually preview it here as well if you, if you want to see what that sounds like, but it's not very responsive. So I would, so, I'll actually play it this time. Oh, well. Okay, so yeah, you just wanted to hear what the camera audio sounds like. You'll notice the channel here is here changed. You'll notice it's very quiet. If I increase, increase the audio there so you can hear it better, you'll notice it's very echoey, very tinny. Doesn't sound very good at all. So you're just like, okay, I don't want to use that channel. So I'll just right click on that again audio channels, I'll set them both so that it's the right channel. And now, once again, you'll notice they change. Two pieces of video together, it's almost the same shot. Like if you have and that is a lot better, like a lot better. And in this particular case, they actually um, got the audio pretty much where it needs to be. It doesn't sound too loud, it doesn't sound too quiet. But um, even in a, pro a professional setting, when you're interviewing someone, sometimes there can be moments when they get a little nervous and they start speaking a little quieter than they were, or they, they have a spontaneous bout of laughter because of something that happened and, and it just peaks and uh, it, it just throws everything out of whack. It's just not looking good. So you'll want to make adjustments. Um, so the way to do that, you'll notice I adjusted this line here. This is the volume line. And you just, just in a general sense, if you want the entire clip to be louder or quieter, you just grab onto here. You'll notice that when the icon changed, it has that little, um, those two arrows there pointing up and down. Just grab that and you can move it up to make it louder. And you'll notice there's the numbers at the bottom there telling you by how much you are making it louder. Uh, zero is what the clip is naturally, um, and the numbers are telling you how much you are adjusting it by. So it might be a bit a bit confusing because there's decibels on the side here, and this thing's mentioning decibels as well. But just remember that the one on the side is the objective measurement of how loud um, the clip that's coming through is. And this is merely by how much you are adjusting it in any direction. So you can make it louder, you can make the whole thing quieter. To do something a little more precise though, you're gonna wanna make something called a keyframe. Um, and the way you can do that is by pressing um, the command key and then clicking on the line here, you'll notice when I'm hovering over the line, it has that um, volume adjustment. I hold down Command and I click, and I've created a keyframe. Now, at the moment, that keyframe's not doing much. It's um, if I try to move it around, it looks like it just kept things the same. But if I give it a friend right there, now when I move his friend up and down you'll notice it looks quite a bit different. So what's happened here is that when you add a keyframe to, um, to an audio track, you're basically telling it, I want the volume to be this loud at this particular 
time. Um, or I, or more accurately, I want the volume to be this much adjusted at this particular time. So at this particular moment, I want to be zero adjusted. I don't want it adjusted at all. But at this particular time, I want it to be adjusted downward this much. And let's listen to what that sounds like. Um, so I'll put that back up to where it was. So you can hear what and that section sounds time, like. Kind of sends out and all of a sudden it just kind of jerks because you kind of piece out. And now let me show you what it looks like when I take that end, I dip and it down. Same shot and kind of sends out and all of a sudden. Because I moved it exactly to the bottom, it slowly faded out her voice and now you can't hear her at all. And you can do the exact opposite as well. Shot and you kind of sends out and all of a sudden it just kind of jerks because you kind of piece out. And and you can add not just one or two, you can add as many of these points as you want. And each and every one can be adjusted however you suit it. So if you are having particular moments that are spiking, um, where somebody's talking too loud, and uh, just to show you what a spike looks like, I'm going to set a certain section here up to as loud as it can go. So you want to... Uh, the way you can tell something is, is spiking or peaking is by checking the VU meter here. Okay. And when those red lines show up, that's indicating to you that the audio has gone loud enough to where the program can't represent it. So you want to... So it's distorting the cool. audio, basically. That's what that means. So it's, it's something to avoid. Um, so duh, 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 duh. Um, to more, so we have all these options down here, but to more, um, to more accurately get something like that done, you, you'll want to use the effects panel up here. So if you go to a, um, effect controls, You'll notice that I've put in how many? One, two, three, four, five, six of these guys. There's one, two, three, four, five, six um, keyframes listed here on the levels bar. So, say I am trying to adjust this particular point. Um, it's at negative 2.3. I want it to be at negative 2.5. So, I'm like, uh, well, trying, really trying. It's not a bit, I am legitimately trying, it's just not coming, it's just not getting there. Well, what do I do? Well, um, if I go to the keyframe here, I can select it, I can make sure that I'm adjusting it by using these arrows here. Those automatically take you to where the nearest keyframe is. And then I just click on this value here, negative 2.3, and I can type in negative 2.5. And that's where it is now. All right. So, and uh, the reason why you'd want to make sure you're snapped onto the right keyframe is because if I'm in the middle of two ones and I try to adjust it here, it'll actually create a new keyframe for that point. So, you want to make sure you're avoiding doing that. Um, and uh, this is another class in and of itself. I recommend you take the audition class to get more info on this particular part. But there's, you'll notice that, um, that each point on here is, has a straight line going from it to, to it. And if you're listening very carefully, it might be harder to tell because this isn't a music track, it's a person talking. But it sounds somewhat un... Um, the, the volume change sounds um, not quite natural. You can alter that by clicking on any of the keyframes in here and right clicking it and switching it from linear to Bezier. And you'll notice that instead of being a, a straight line, it's now curved. Unsettling. So it's, it's a lot more gradual um, and for most things, you'll want to be using Bezier's instead of linear. And you'll notice there's these other options too, and I encourage you on your own time to check out what each of those do. Just experiment with them, but I don't quite have the time here to explain um, exactly how to use each and every one. Um, 
to, to, to delete one if you don't want one there anymore. Just click on it, click delete, and you'll notice it disappeared right here, and now it's just pretending it never existed. Uh, if you don't want the audio to be changing at all, um, if, you, if you're like, well, I, I, I just want to get rid of all of them, that you can either just delete them all by, by um, highlighting them like this, clicking delete, or you can also just um, click this toggle animation button. It looks like a little stopwatch, and it'll give you a warning that that'll delete all the keyframes, but you can just say, I, I don't care. And now everything is back at the same level. If you want to animate the keyframes again, you're going to have to click this. It won't bring back the ones that you have. It'll just create a brand new keyframe right there. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, um, and before we move on to any questions, I'm going to uh, just briefly talk about music tracks because you're going to want that. So if I go to my music folder here, the main thing is just you want to make sure that your music fits stylistically with what you're trying to do. So I know it may be tempting sometimes to be like, I really like this song or my friend's band made me this song and I, I just want to use it. Um, but if certain songs work better in certain contexts. So for instance, this is a very, this video here that we're working on is sort of an educational video. It's meant to be explaining to people a concept that they haven't heard of before. Um, so you'll want something a little, a little low key, um, just, just sort, so just sort of, uh, just sort of mellow, really. So you wouldn't want something, something like this from, uh, from uh, um, Metal Gear. Uh, um, rising. Yeah, a little over the top. <laughs> um, you'll want, for, so for this particular video, you'll want uh, probably something a little more along the lines of this. <laughs> Just some basic corporate music. Obviously, I'm not saying you can't, you can't make something like that. Um, you can't like, expand upon this you don't have to use like corporate music if you don't want to but the main thing is just you don't want it to be clashing with the video you're making um and then when you put it in here you'll notice that it's a little it's gonna be a little loud for her kind of drowning her out so just use those techniques we just worked on there just kind of lower the volume a little bit Make it maybe, maybe down, about down there. And all of a sudden it just kind of jerks. Of That's a little better. You can make it a touch quieter though. You don't want it, you want it to accentuate what she's saying, not overpower her. It just kind of jerks because you pick this out and it's really... And that's quite a bit better. And obviously you can use those other techniques I mentioned with the lowering and the raising to make it so it, it, it's up at a pretty high place when you first start the video. And then it lowers um, as, as she gets into some concepts. And then maybe it raises back up again at the end. Um, obviously, a lot of options um, for working with that. But yeah, that's just the main thing. Just make sure it fits. Make sure it doesn't overpower. Um, and, and your music track will be good. So, um, it, so now, any questions? Any questions at all now? See, check in the chat here. So yeah, Gene just mentioned the, um, the graphic equalizer. So if I go, um, or what is it? It's under effects. So yeah, so that would it. be under the audio effects um, panel here. Yeah. So it's, it, yeah, graphic equalizer. Um, let's add that on there. And I believe that just adjusts them um, automatically or does that have to be set up? The default is just flat, but then if you open, if you actually click on graphic equalizer, open a window, there are presets up above, 
and then it will give you a range like at the bottom it says vocal presence boost cut those are pretty straightforward you see what those do um quick low pass filter gets rid of yeah. it, well, well it does what it says um anyway that's what this guy says okay okay yeah um a lot of options for doing something like that you'll notice there's the, the different ones down here um but i'll move on to how those how just effects in general work in a little bit. Um, there's an, if, is there an automated way to know if there's an audio spike or drop between clips? Um, so as far as I know, the, as far as I know, it's not loudness really, radar. sorry? Loudness radar does that. It's also an effect that you have to select all of your audio and then put the loudness radar on and it'll okay. give you that. Yeah, so that's that's just an effect on there as well. What's called the radar? Oh yeah, loudness radar. So if I put that on here. And you can <laughs> there's a lot of different settings you can put up, put on there. Um, complicated. It is, yeah. Um, so I'm not going to get too much into that. I, I do. I'd recommend just in general for most effects, you'll just just play around with them, see what they do, um, and kind kind of kind kind of feel your way out. There's a lot of customization you can do. Um, Generally, the tracks also um, when you if you have a clip section. You'll be able to see it if you expand your audio, your waveforms, and you just learn to see what it looks like because it the top just gets cut off. Um, and that you know, we're in uh, Final Cut. There's an actual you can see the it, it kind of highlights it in red where it peaks. Um, Premiere doesn't do that, and neither does Audition, but that's like the surefire way before you normalize or use anything else to figure out what sections are blown out or distorted that's just the visual cue is a good place to start okay um so yeah uh moving on then um uh, actually if nobody oh what is if nobody else wants to take a break i kind of want to take a, a a couple minute break so i'm just going to say it's 11 20 right now how about we all um, meet back at 11.23. Does that sound good for everybody? That's great. And once again, for anybody who's uh, not done the survey that I dropped in the chat at the beginning of the class, that would be awesome to do that while we're waiting. Okay. Thank you. I'll see everybody in a second.
Are you a guest for some reason, Gene? What's going on here? Um, I kicked myself, and while you were talking, Seth had to let me in. So if you'd like to re-host me, that'd be cool. There you go. Thanks. Happy it was good. I was just like all of a sudden gone. It was brilliant. Best thing I've done all day. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> right, I'll just give another minute. We'll get right back into it. Awesome. I'm just going to offer this. This is Vanessa speaking. First of all, thank you, thank you. I've learned an awful lot. Um, I had a. Um, a video meeting prior to this and I'll have one again uh, that starts at noon. So I apologize. I'm going to have to cut out a little early oh, and right. the only, I don't know what's on your agenda, but the only thing that I would really appreciate um, knowing is uh, the export. So we've got all these collections. I can pre I can think I can figure out how to put titles and all the other stuff, but there's a lot of buttons to push when one exports. Yep. I'm kind of um, differentiating that. So that'd be super helpful. And again, thank you. Thank you. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was going to get into that. Um, we've got titles, transitions, and effects next, and then exporting. And it's that, and the titles, transitions, and effects is not going to be very long, I assure you. Um, so. Okay. So, is everyone back by now? Hopefully. Perfect. All right. I'll start screen sharing again. Okay. So now we're going to go into titles and this is not going to take very long because um, fortunately Premiere has um, rather limited the ability, you, the, the, what you can do with the, its titles. Back in the old CS6 days, you'd be able to Make um, make a little credits roll. You could have a black have a background to it. You could have all these different text options. Um, but at the moment, this is pretty much all you're limited to. So you use this text tool here. You just write out what you want, and at the side here, over in the effects controls, you have all these. Um, all these little tools to work with so you can show where, where you want to position it. You have font size, you have font type, all of that. And gotta make sure the text is highlighted too. And it's fine for very quick titles that maybe stand-ins or uh, ju just, um, just like a very quick like annotation or something like that. But unfortunately, if you really want any kind of professional looking titles or end credits or anything like that, I would recommend making them in, in Photoshop or um, Adobe Illustrator and then importing them into here as a, as a, uh, a picture file. Um, just because it's it's very very limited in what you're able to do, so I'll just show you what the actual backgrounds look like, so you can get a better idea. That's what they consider a background nowadays. Um, <laughs> not very impressive, as I said. They they kind they they used to have something that you could that was a little more usable, but they've they've really rolled that back. Um, so uh, back, so now we're going on to transitions. So once again, it's in this effects panel here, and just to just just so you're when you're navigating across these ones, let me just open up a few more folders. If the effects tab gets kind of lost to the side here, you can always easily find it by clicking these two arrows, and then you just um, click on the effects bank. Um, so uh, transitions, uh, as I mentioned before, um, you can change which transition is your default and you use Command D in order to apply it. But there's all sorts of different kinds of ones. And 
just like with the music and just like with titles, just like with anything, you want to use transitions that are appropriate to the video that you're making. So, um, it, so in a video like this, dissolves, of course, are, are perfectly fine. Um, maybe something like a, like a slide, maybe. Let's see how that looks. Together. Um, if you don't yeah, that's not that's not too bad, but there are some like very over the top ones. So if I were to use a three D motion, um, for instance, uh, or you can also get another shot the same interview. <laughs> little little silly for this kind of video, and uh, the, just the base basic idea is just same thing with the music. Just make sure it's appropriate. Um, Make sure your transition isn't isn't super garish for what you're doing. Obviously, if you're making if you're making something that's sort of like a funhouse type video, that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but just just keep it just just keep it on theme, basically. Um, you might also notice that while there are quite a few, it's not a ton of different transitions, and unfortunately, just like with the titles. Um, Adobe's kind of just um, ki kind of just like offloaded a lot of its transitions and its effects into After Effects. So uh, a lot more of that side of things can be found in After Effects. And I'm not going to go into After Effects right here because that could be its own class series in and of itself. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the defaults in here, and you have you have quite a few, but you don't have tons. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then as far as effects, um, these are the kinds you're looking for. And just just so you know, if you're looking for a specific kind of effect, so if you're looking for a specific kind of key, you can just type that in there, and anything that matches will come up. Um, so let's say I want to apply, um, I don't know, let's make some basic green screen effects. I'm going to take this picture here. Oh wait, that's, that's a title. I am going to take this right here, um, put that under this um, video, and now I'm going to try and chroma key away the blue. This is not recommended on videos that were not designed to be chroma key, but I'm just going to show off uh, exactly how it works. So if I go to the ultra key here, double click that, um, I grab the eyedropper tool. Um, okay, didn't realize that was something it needed. Okay. Well, never mind then. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna. I'm just going to guess at it then. So if I have ultra key, I'm just gonna set it to that time blue. Normally you drag and drop, but it looks like there's a permissions error going on, so I can't really fix that right now. And that color is about the same there. And how's that look? It's not looking great. Oh, oh. Set it to color channel alpha. Oh, alpha's just not showing up at all. Okay. All right, I'm gonna take pick a different effect just because uh, not being able to pick the color is uh, really messing. Oh, I see what happened. Okay, my mistake here was that I had the title here selected to chroma key it, not the video. So I'm just gonna delete that and now if I go back to here, going to get the color. There we go. That's looking more like I, what I was expecting. Okay, so we've got all of this stuff going on here. You can adjust all the different things. Um, and yeah, just made a thing with effects, transitions, things like that. Just play around with the different settings and you'll be able to discover a lot on your own. Um, and it, it, there's a lot of options in here, even though it is limited in comparison to like After Effects or even in comparison to Adobe Premiere from several years ago, it's still 
tons of different options. And uh, here's another uh, tip here. So say this is interview two, right? No, interview three. So say I want to keep that green screen going across there. So say for some reason I've decided that this is the perfect chroma key that I could ever want. Um, I, I, let's just pretend that. And I want to copy that um, onto this one. I want to keep it exactly the same. I d um, and obviously you don't want to go through all these settings and like, oh, okay, I got to do 34, 10, 98. You don't want to have to do that. You just right click, um, you just, well, you just click on the top here where the um, effect is, right click it, click copy, um, or alternatively command C to copy it. Go, you select this clip, and then I believe you can do, yep, you right click and you hit paste. And now they both have the same effect for better or for worse. And you can also do this with other things in here. So these are the different options for position, scale, rotation. So we adjust that. Let's uh, flip this upside down, up and down. Rotate it that way, this way and that. Okay, I, I really want to copy this one over to here. You can do that too. Just right click, copy it. And then paste. And it's copied that same effect. Now something to keep in mind though, is say you've applied a key effect. Let me just reset this because this is very goofy. You can reset by, um, by clicking this uh, little uh, circular arrow here. And that resets it on that side. Let me reset it here as well. Um, say I've applied a key effect to all the clips I want. And I'm like, well, I really, um, I've, I've come up with this great idea. I'm gonna make some changes that'll that'll really affect how good this looks. Oh, that looks fantastic, right? Um, I, okay, so now I wanna copy this and apply it to all of them. So let's just do the same thing. Let's make copy. I'm gonna go over to this other clip I want, gonna click paste. And well, didn't quite turn out the way I was expecting, but um, I was hoping it would look even worse than that, believe it or not. But, um, the thing is, you'll notice that when I pasted the ultra key effect here, it added a second one. It added it on top of this first one here. And that's something to bear in mind when you're pasting in any effects that you paste that aren't motion or opacity will not replace the one that you have there. It'll stack. So just keep that in mind. Um, I've seen people um, get messed up on that particular one before. So it's, it's just very, very easy to accidentally be like, oh, for some reason, the ultra key, when I copied it over, it looks totally different on this other clip. What's happening? That's, that's what's happening. And you don't need to necessarily click on each one individually either. You do like a highlight. Like I want everything to have this. Just highlight them all and you use that shortcut for pasting, Command V, and now each of them has that effect on it. Once again, for better or for worse. Um, and I, I think I know where my vote is on that. Uh, with, so, okay, so that's it. And before I move on to exporting, do we have any questions on, on effects and transitions and titles? Looking good. All right. So now, final uh, section on how to export your video. So we've made this lovely video here of absolute nonsense. I want to export it. So um, the way you do that is you go up to File, and then click Export Media. You'll come up with a dialog box that looks like this. Now, there's a lot of um, options here, but it's a lot simpler than it might seem. Um, the 
because and the and it's a lot, lot simpler just because the output that it wants to make is basically the same as the initial sequence you made. So when I first drag and dropped that video in there that I modeled this timeline sequence after, it's it's made it so that um, the video you're going to export is of the same variety. So you know it's 29.97, 1920, 1080, all, all of that stuff is the same. Uh, you'll notice this button up here called match sequence settings. Um, what that does, it'll actually, in this case, export as an MXF file. Um, it, when it's not, um, the, the match sequence settings is a little misleading because it's not actually matching the initial video you put in. It's matching literally how the timeline is reading itself. So it comes out as MXF or sometimes um, um, MPEG. And that's, and for most people, that's not what they're looking for. You'd want it in an MOV or an MP4. So I'd recommend most of the time not selecting that. Um, so for, if you're just trying to get like a really good quality um, file, uh, as always for most things, I recommend selecting the format as QuickTime, going to the presets, Apple ProRes 422, um, just because that is a very good codec. It's a very, it's very consistent, um, and it looks nice. That, that's the main thing. Um, down here is the output name. You can change what it's called. So if I went to exports, I want to call this uh, class demonstration. And you can select where it goes to. Of course, I recommend putting it in your own little exports folder right here. So click save. Um, so, so down here, you have a few more options, but this is that most of the time, if you just collect, if you just make sure that the format and the preset are what you want, it's, it's all fine. Um, now, if you're trying to make something that's not just good quality, but really great quality, you'll want to make sure that this button down here is clicked, the use maximum render quality. Um, and that'll just, uh, that just does exactly what it says on the tin. It uses the, the maximum render quality as far as it can see it. And there is also a different setting that can, that um, helps with certain things. Where was that? It, Gene, where was the past settings? I haven't seen that. That depends on how you have your output set up. Okay. So it should be right there, and right where you are, but because of the way you've got it set up, there it's not giving you the option. So if you were okay. in H.264, you would have yeah. the option. All right, I'm going to set to H.264 real quick then. Uh, H.264 is also really good. You'll notice it's a pretty small file size. If you're... Um, like not talking about the passes at the moment, but if you're just trying to send like a very low level kind of copy because you want to save space on a hard drive or you're trying to share it with someone and you don't want to send several gigabytes worth of video, which in ProRes, it'll, you'll be, you should expect about one gigabyte per minute. Um, but obviously in this, this video here is about eight minutes long because of that music track. It's only coming out to about half a gigabyte right there. Um, so the thing I was looking for. So go down to bitrate settings, VBR1 pass. Yeah, so bitrate settings are something also that can be used to really enhance your video if you want. Um, so for instance, I put on the two pass there. You can change the target bitrate and make it larger. And this'll, this'll take like 20 years to process, but when it comes out on the other end, oh boy, you're gonna, you're gonna see something sweet. Um, but as I said, for, for most cases, if you're just looking for a nice high quality video, QuickTime, ProRes 422, use maximum render quality and you're good to go. Um, 
If you click the Q button, that will send it to Adobe Media Encoder. Um, and from there, you can just keep working on your project here. Um, if you don't have Media Encoder or you just, or you, you're just fine with not editing things any further, like if you would send it to Media Encoder if you're working on multiple things and you don't want to just like sit back and watch it render for 20 minutes, you, you know, you still, you still want to work on some stuff, you'd send it to Media Encoder instead. Or you just click straight export and it'll start exporting on its own. Let me just show you what Q looks like. It'll take a second for Media Encoder to start up. Uh, let's see, noticing some chat bubbles, what's going on here? Yep, uh, Vaughn just pointed out that H.264 is what you use when you're uploading to YouTube or Vimeo, that's true. Um, YouTube compresses um, every video that gets uploaded to it. So, um, so while ProRes might be like the higher quality, it, it's when you upload H.264, um, basically ProRes is just gonna take longer because it's a bigger file and it'll end up looking about the same as the H.264 is, so that's, that's just how it is. Um, does maximum render quality use the highest quality of the lowest quality clip? The mixing camera footage with phone. It uses the highest quality of the timeline of the sequences settings. So if that initial video you dropped in to make the sequence out of, oh, and by the way, um, just show you if you already have a sequence up here. If you right click on, a, on any video in here, you can select new sequence from clip. And that's another way to make a sequence. Um, but uh, it depends on which one you used initially to set up the sequence. If you use that um, phone footage, it would come out at the quality of the phone footage. If you use the camera's footage, it'll come out the quality of the camera's footage. Although, I would like to point out that while that while the video itself will be in that quality format, um, do not expect that a lower quality video that you drop in there will somehow become high quality just because it's, 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 um, it's being exported at a higher, um, at a higher dimension than, than it is. It, it can only work with what it, with what it has. There is no such thing as zoom in and enhance. So, um, just, I know that wasn't the question, but just to point that out to people. Um, so, so Mike is saying, I want to click export media or Apple M, nothing pap, um, pops up. So, um, so, so you have to have your uh, timeline selected or the sequence selected? Yeah. So if I, if for instance, I have the source here selected, I go to export media it won't pop up with anything um and i'm not sure why it isn't grayed out i know in older versions it would gray it out and that might be a small bug that's going on but you have to have your actual sequence selected right here you can tell it's selected because it's got the blue ring then you go file export media and then it'll work Um, okay, so that is the main part of the presentation then. Um, let's see, there's anything else. So, um, just, just so that everybody knows, we are available anytime, me and Gene. Um, if you if you have any other technical questions about Premiere Pro, um, just send us an email. My email is uh, glenn at metroist.org, G-L-E-N-N, -N, and Gene's is gene at metroist.org, G-E-N-E. So if you have any Premiere-related questions or any software Mac-related questions, send us an email. We can help you out. Um, and just for further learning, I recommend just um, YouTube videos, YouTube demonstrations are a good way to, to learn fervor stuff. They can go into a lot more detail than I can. 
Um, or uh, lynda.com um, is also a really good resource. If you have a library card uh, for Multnomah County Library, you can actually um, get, uh, get access to Lynda for free. Um, if you, the, the Multnomah County Library is kind of hard to navigate its website. I'd recommend just Googling Multnomah County Lynda um, and that'll, you'll find it easier. But um, so yeah, that's the, that's the main section there. Got 10 minutes to spare. Um, any questions going on? Are there more learning sessions in online learning sessions in the works? Yes, uh, Jean, uh, you're working on an Adobe, or, or sorry, in a audition class um, uh, next week, is it? Yeah, that's next Thursday. Um, that's the only thing I'm working on, because that's plenty. And I just shared to everyone the uh, um, selfie, uh, the mask selfie um, contest that we're having, and just wanted to reshare that so everybody knows to enter. If you've got some skills in that regard, take killer selfies with mask on. Enter, and you can win a fifty dollars gift card. Um, so yeah, like Glenn said, next week is Adobe Audition, where we're going to delve into the audio world, and get into um basically all that you can do with sound design editing mixing and just sound manipulation with adobe and the workflow between premiere and audition is so awesome because you can just basically if you've got a clip and you happen to be in premiere and you want to take it further you can literally just um it like you right click and it says edit clip in Adobe Audition, you flip into the high powered world of Adobe Audition and you can do whatever you want. Yeah. So I like it for that reason because I tend to be, you know, more of a Premiere user than a Final Cut user. So um, that, that link you're sharing, let me see here. Uh oh, did I kill it? Apparently it's uh, having some issues. Oh, great. Have a, just stay tuned to our website and our and our newsletter because it'll come out in that. Okay. Oh, realize it's still still sharing my screen. Okay. Um, the the other thing is we also have we're somebody asked about more content in the pipeline. We're gonna have a photography with your phone uh, workshop coming up fairly soon, and then we're probably gonna do some sort of Adobe Lightroom based workshop. All right, and the great thing about most Adobe products is that they sync well with each other. So Photoshop syncs very well with all of them. After Effects syncs well, um, and, and yeah, as he mentioned, Audition does. So it's it's all interconnected, um, which is which is really nice. So.